Assalamu alaikum, format literal barrer. How are you today? We are going to continue our lessons about the uh, the third chapter in the fourth part about the economy in the short run, the business cycle theory. Today we are going to uh, talk about the Mandel Fleming uh, model and the exchange rate uh, regime. So in this chapter, uh, we extend our analysis of aggregate demand to include the international trade and finance. As you know, the model uh, developed in this chapter called Mandel uh, Fleming model is close relative to the ISLM model as both of them stress the interaction between the goods market and the money market. Both models assume that the price level is fixed and then show what causes short-term fluctuations in aggregate income or uh, equivalently shifts in the aggregate demand curve. But the key difference in the uh, ISLM uh, model assumed a closed economy, whereas here in this chapter, the Mandel Fleming model assumes an open economy. So the Mandel Fleming model makes one important and extreme assumption, which is assumed that the economy being uh, studies is a small open economy with perfect capital mobility. That is the economy can borrow or lend as much as it wants in the world financial market. Again, the capital mobility, which means the economy can borrow or lend as much as it wants in the world financial markets. And as a result, the economy's interest rate is determined by the world interest rate. So in this chapter, we'll learn the Mandel Fleming uh, model to the ISLM for the small uh, open uh, economy. Uh, the causes and the effects of the interest rate uh, differentials uh, the arguments for uh, fixed versus the floating exchange rates, how to derive the aggregate demand curve for a small open economy. So now we can see the differences between this model and the uh, ISLM model as the, there is a change in the interest uh, rates from country to another, the exchange rates uh, will be an important factor in this uh, model. So let's know about the uh, Mandel Fleming uh, model, the assumptions of the model, small open economy with perfect capital mobility. Okay. Uh, so we have the world interest rate now, not the interest rate. The, also the goods market equilibrium, uh, denoted by the IS uh, curve or the world IS curve. Also, uh, where uh, now we have, uh, see the E is the nominal exchange rate, which is the foreign currency per unit domestic currency. So the world's IS curve, or goods market equilibrium, uh, <clears throat> as we know, the IS curve is drawn for a given value of the world interest rate. Uh, as the interest rate decreases, the uh, net exports, in this case, increases, and the output and the income will increase. So we, we now added to this equation of the IS curve, the net exports as we are talking about an open economy. The LM curve, which is the money uh, market equilibrium, we can see also the LM curve is drawn for a given value of the world interest rate which is vertical because the uh, world interest rate is given. There is only one value for output that equates money demand with supply, regardless of the exchange rate. So <clears throat> this graph of the Mandel Fleming model plots the good market equilibrium conditions and the money market equilibrium conditions. Both curves together are drawn holding the interest rate interest rate constant at the world interest rate. So the intersection of these two curves show the level of income and the exchange rate that satisfies equilibrium both in the goods market and in the money market. 
as we can see on the graph. Second section in this lesson, the floating and fixed exchange rates. In a system of floating exchange rates, the, uh, the exchange rate, the nominal exchange rate is allowed to fluctuate in response to changed economic conditions. So in the floating system or floating exchange rates, the nominal exchange rate is allowed to fluctuate in response to according to the changes in the economic aid conditions. In contrast, under the fixed exchange rates, the central bank trades domestic for foreign currency at a predetermined price. Okay, then the floating system or floating exchange rates, uh, it responds to the changes in the economic conditions, but in the fixed exchange rate, it's a, the central bank who determine the uh, price So, next, the policy analysis first in a floating exchange rate system, then in a fixed exchange rate system, let's see the fiscal policy, okay, under the floating exchange rate. When we talk about fiscal policy, so the government spending and the taxes. So, an increase in government purchases, for example, or decrease in taxes shifts the IS curve, as we know, to the right. So this raises the exchange rate, as you can see here now from this graph. This raises the exchange rate, but has no effect on the income. So at any given value of nominal exchange rate, a fiscal expansion, a like government purchases or decreasing taxes, that uh, it increase uh, the output, shifting the IS curve to the uh, right. So what we can learn from this, in a small open economy with perfect capital mobility, as you can borrow and lend uh, from country to another and so on, fiscal policy cannot affect the real GDP. In a small open economy with perfect capital mobility, fiscal policy cannot affect the real GDP. Crowding out in the closed economy, fiscal policy crowds out investment by causing the interest rate to rise. In the small open economy, fiscal policy crowds out net exports by causing the exchange rate to appreciate. This is the fiscal policy. What about the monetary policy under the floating exchange rate? An increase in the money supply shifts the LM curve to the right, lowering the exchange rate and raising the income. So any increase in the money supply will shift the LM curve to the right, as we know, because output must rise to restore the equilibrium in money markets. So it shifts from Y1 to Y2. With the change of the, uh, what we can learn from this uh, example, monetary policy affects the output, not like the fiscal policy. Monetary policy affects output by affecting the components of the aggregate demand. As we saw in the closed economy, if we increase the money supply, so the interest rate will decrease, so the investment will increase, and the output and income will increase. In a small open economy, increasing the money supply will decrease the nominal exchange rate, so that increases the net export and increases the output and the income. So, expansionary monetary policy doesn't raise world aggregate demand. It merely shifts the demand from foreign to domestic products. Again, the expansionary monetary supply a policy doesn't raise the world aggregate demand, but it merely shifts the demand from foreign to domestic products. So the increase in domestic income and employment are at the expense of losses abroad because as we know that the whole world is a closed economy. Okay, the third thing now in our model, the trade policy. So we have the fiscal policy, the monetary policy, and now the trade policy. Trade policy under the floating exchange rate. At any given value of nominal exchange rate, a tariff or quota 
reduces the imports and increases the net exports so that shifts the IS curve to the right. So the result will be increasing the nominal exchange rate and the output will not increase. So import restrictions like tariffs, quotas, and so on cannot reduce a trade deficit. Even though the net exports in unchanged, there is less trade as the trade restriction reduces the imports, exchange rate appreciation reduces exports. So less trade means fewer gains from trade. Import restrictions on a specific products save jobs in the domestic industries that produce those products, but destroy jobs in export producing sectors. So import restrictions fail to increase the total employment and also import restrictions create sectoral shifts which cause frictional unemployment. Third section in this uh, lesson, the fixed exchange rates. Under the fixed exchange rates, the central bank stands ready to buy or sell the domestic currency for foreign currency at a predetermined rate. So in the Mandel Fleming model, the central bank shifts the LM curve as required to keep the nominal exchange, exchange rate at its pre-announced rate. So this system fixes the nominal exchange rate in the long run when prices are flexible. The real exchange rate can move even if the nominal rate is fixed. Okay, let's see the fiscal policy under the fixed exchange rate. Now we have the IS curve and the LM curve. Under the, uh, so under the floating rates, a fiscal expansion would raise the nominal exchange rate to keep the nominal exchange rate from rising. The central bank must sell domestic currency, which increases the money supply and shifts the LM curve to the right. So we have no change in uh, nominal exchange rate and the output will increase. So under floating rates, fiscal policy is ineffective at changing output, but now, under fixed rates, fiscal policy is very effective at changing the output. As we can see, with a fixed exchange rate, uh, a fiscal expansion shifts the IS curve to the right, then that induces a shift in the LM curve and raising the income. The monetary policy under the fixed exchange rate, an increase in money supply would shift the LM curve to the right which reduces the uh, nominal exchange uh, rate. And to prevent the fall in nominal exchange rate, the central bank must buy domestic currency, which reduces the money supply and shifts the LM back to the left. So the result now, we have, there is no change in the nominal exchange rate and also no change in the output. So under the floating rates, if you remember, Monetary policy is very effective at changing output. But now under fixed rates, monetary policy cannot be used to affect the output. Let's see the third factor, the trade policy under the fixed exchange rates. Any restriction on imports put upward pressure on the nominal exchange rate. So to keep the nominal exchange rate from rising, the central bank must sell domestic currency, which increases the money supply and shifts the LM curve to the right, as you can see. So there uh, will be, <clears throat> while no change in the nominal exchange rate, but there will be an increase in the output and the income. <clears throat> so as we saw in the floating rates, Import restrictions doesn't affect the output or the net exports, but under the fixed rates, import restrictions increase the output and the net export. But these gains come at the expense of other countries as the policy merely shifts demand from foreign to domestic goods. 
let's take a summary of the policy effects in the uh, Mandel Fleming uh, model. As you can see, we have the fiscal policy or expansion, the monetary expansion, the import or the trade policy or import restrictions. As you can see, uh, we have two types of exchange rate regimes, floating and uh, fixed. Uh, in the fiscal uh, expansion, uh, in the uh, policy, the fiscal expansion policy in the floating uh, regime, there is no change in the output. There is an increase in the nominal exchange rate. There is a decrease in net exports and so on in the monetary expansion in the floating regime. The uh, nominal exchange rate decreased and the output and net export both increase. And the import restrictions at the floating uh, exchange rate regime, the nominal exchange rate increase and the output and net exports not changed. You can see also the differences here in the fixed uh, regime. So the fourth part in our lesson, the interest rate differentials. So we saw, uh, we talk about the exchange rates now, about the interest rate differentials, two reasons why the interest rate may differ from the world interest rates. First, ha we have now the country risk. The country risk, the risk that the country's borrowers will default on their loan repayments because of political or economic turmoil. Okay, as lenders require a higher interest rate to compensate them for this risk. Okay. Another reason is expected exchange rate changes. If a country's exchange rate is expected to fall, then its borrowers must pay a higher interest rate to compensate lenders for the expected currency depreciation. So the country risk from defaulting and also the expected currency depreciations. So differentials in the Mandel Fleming uh, model. Now we have the interest rate equals the world interest rate plus the risk premium. This uh, denoted by the Greek letter theta, the risk premium, which is assumed exogenous. Substitute the expression uh, for, for the interest uh, rate into the IS curve and the LM equations. Uh, so the effects of an increase in the, any increase in the risk premium uh, that affects we can see the IS shifts to the left because any increase in the uh, risk premium will increase the interest rate as we saw in the previous equation. And if the interest rate increases, the investment will decrease. This is the, IL, uh, the IS shift. Okay. The LM curve shifts to the right because if the risk uh, premium increase, so the interest rate will increase and the money demanded will decrease in this case. So the output must rise to restore money market equilibrium. Now, as we can see from the graph, the Y or the uh, output must rise to restore the money market equilibrium. Okay, so the results here, we have uh, a negative change in the uh, nominal exchange rate or decreasing and the increase in the output and in. Okay. Continuing in the effects of the increase in the um, uh, risk premium, the fall in the uh, nominal exchange rate, as we saw, an increase country risk or expected depreciation makes holding the country's currency less attractive and expected depreciation is a self-fulfilling prophecy so the increase in output occurs because the post in net exports from depreciation is greater than the fall in investment which happens from the rise in the interest rate so why income might not rise in this case. The central bank may try to prevent the depreciation by reducing the money supply. The central bank may try to prevent this depreciation. How? By reducing the money supply. So the depreciation might boost the price of imports enough to increase the price level 
which would reduce real money supply. So consumers might respond to the increased risk by holding more money. Each of the above would shift the LM curve to the left forward. Let's take a case study, the, the Mexican peso crisis. The peso is the currency of Mexico. Um, as you can see, to the, till the year of 1994, um, uh, after this year, the peso lost nearly 40% of its value after floating. To know the uh, history of this crisis, U.S. goods more expensive to Mexicans. Okay, U.S. firms lost revenue, hundreds of bankruptcies along U.S.-Mexican borders. Mexican uh, assets worth less in dollars. And that's why the, this crisis didn't just hurt Mexico, but also U United States and the other countries that have trade relations with reducing the wealth of millions of U.S. citizens. So to understand the crisis in the early 19th, Mexico was an attractive place for foreign investment. During 1994, political developments caused an increase in Mexico's risk premium. Mm -hmm. Peasant uprising Chivas, assassination of leading presidential candidate. Another factor also, the Federal Reserve raised U.S. interest rates several times during 1994 to prevent U.S. inflation. So the increase in the world interest rate was more than zero or uh, there was increase of positive. These events put downward pressure on the peso. Uh, Mexico's central bank had repeatedly promised foreign investors that it would not allow the peso's value to fall. So it bought pesos and sold dollars to prop up the peso exchange rate. Doing this requires the Mexicans uh, central bank have adequate reserves of dollars, but who knows, they do have or not. Let's see the dollar reserves of Mexico's central bank in 1993, December 1993. The reserves was uh, $28 billion. In August 1994, it was $17 billion. In December 1994, it was $9 billion. In December fifteenth, uh, nineteen ninety four, was only seven billion dollars. So during nineteen ninety four, Mexico's central bank hid the fact that its reserves were being depleted. The disaster here at twentieth of December, Mexico devalues the peso by thirteen percent. So fixes the nominal interest rate at twenty fifth, at twenty five cents instead of 29 cents. So investors are shocked. They had no idea Mexico was running out of reserves. The risk premium increases. The investors dump their Mexican assets and pull their capital out of Mexico. So at December 22nd, central bank's reserves nearly gone. It abandons the fixed rate and lets the nominal exchange rate float. In a week, the nominal exchange rate falls another 30%. The rescue package from this, uh, to save this uh, Mexico from this crisis, at 1995, United States and the International Monetary Fund set up a $50 billion line of credit to provide loan guarantees to Mexico's government. This helped restore the confidence in Mexico, reducing the risk premium. After a hard recession in 1995, Mexico began a strong recovery from this crisis. Another case, the Southeast Asian crisis of 1997. In this case, problems in the banking system eroded international confidence in the Southeast Asian economies. Also, the risk premiums and the interest rate rose. Stock prices fell as foreign investors sold assets and bought their capital out. Falling stock prices reduced the value of collateral used for bank loans, increasing default rates, which uh, exacerbated 
the prices and the capital outflows the best exchange rates as you can see the depreciation and the negative numbers of the exchange rates and the stock markets and the nominal gdp in some uh, eastern or asian countries at this time of the crisis now the floating versus the fixed exchange uh, rates <clears throat> the argument for floating rates they say allows monetary policy to be used to pursue other goals like stable growth low inflation and so on and the argues for fixed rates they say avoids uncertainty and volatility making international transactions easier disciplines monetary policy to prevent excessive money growth and hyperinflation <clears throat> but the impossible trinity here that if we have the free capital flows or fixed exchange rate or independent monetary policy a nation cannot have a free capital flow independent monetary policy and fixed exchange rate at the same time it's impossible so a nation must choose one side of this triangle and give up the opposite corner like myself we can see option one the united states says this side they have free capital flows and independent monetary policy hong kong have free capital flows and fixed exchange rates china have independent monetary policy and fixed exchange rates <clears throat> let's see the case study of the chinese currency controversy in 1995 to 2005 china fixed its exchange rate at 8.88 yuan per dollar and restricted the capital flows many observers believe that the yuan was significantly undervalued as china was accumulating large dollar reserves united states producers complained that china's cheap yuan gave chinese producers an unfair advantage President Bush asked China to let its currency float. Others in the U.S. wanted tariffs on China's goods. So if China lets the yuan float, it may indeed appreciate. However, if China also allows greater capital mobility, then Chinese citizens may start moving their savings abroad. So such capital outflows could cause the yuan to depreciate rather than appreciate. So this is the Chinese piece. The Mandel Fleming and the uh, aggregate demand curve. So far, in the Mandel Fleming mo uh, model, the price has been fixed. Next, to derive the aggregate demand curve, consider the impact of a change in the price in the Mandel Fleming model. <clears throat> so we now write the Mandel Fleming equations, as you can see now. <clears throat> Earlier in this chapter, the price was fixed, so we could write the NX as a function of the nominal exchange rate instead of the real exchange rate. <clears throat> you can see the change here in the uh, equation. So, driving the uh, aggregate demand curve in the real exchange rate, as you can see. why the uh, aggregate demand curve has negative slope when the price increase from p1 to p2 the money balance will decrease so the lm shifts will uh, shift to the right uh, to the left so the exchange rate the real exchange rate will increase from e1 to e2 so the net exports will decrease so the output and income will decrease and move from y1 to y2 so we have the the aggregate demand curve. from the short run to the long run <clears throat> okay if we have the output here y1 less than the output in the long run then there is downward pressure on prices we have a downward pressure on prices so over time prices will move down causing the 
money uh, balance to increase and the real exchange rate to decrease. So when the real exchange rate decreases, the net exports will increase and the output and the income will increase as you can see what happens gradually and the from the, uh, the prices of the price level from p1 to p2 and so the real exchange rate from e1 to e2 so now we talk about the closed economy the small open economy what about the large economy as many countries including the us are either closed or small open economies so a large open economy is between the polar cases of closed and small open so consider a monetary expansion for example like in a closed economy if uh, the, there is increase in the money supply so there will be a decrease in uh, risk rate and increase in investment though not as much like in a small open economy uh, if there is increase in the money supply so there will be a decrease in real exchange rate and increase in net export so not as much this is our lesson and our chapter uh, today let's take a summary of the mandel fleming model the isla model for a small open economy takes price as given can show how policies and shocks affect income and exchange rate fiscal policy affects income under fixed exchange rates but not under floating exchange rate monetary policy affects income under floating exchange rate but under fixed exchange rate monetary policy is not available to affect outputs interest rate differentials exist exist if the investors require a risk premium to hold a country's assets an increase in the risk premium raises the domestic interest rates and causes the country's exchange rate to depreciate. The fixed versus floating exchange rate. Under the, the floating rates, monetary policy is available for can purposes uh, other than maintaining exchange rate stability. Fixed exchange rates reduce some of the uncertainty in the international transactions. And now we have some uh, of our key terms of this chapter. So, see you next lesson, inshallah. Goodbye and good luck.